This is CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. I'm David Sams. And I'm Victoria Robinson. How you doing? I'm doing good. Well, I want to tell you, I've always thought that you would be absolutely amazing in the middle of all of those crazy women on The View. Oh my gosh, I have prayed for an opportunity to be on The View one day. Oh, I can only imagine what you would do if they let you loose. I I would really love to have a one-on-one with Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg, or a two-on-one, I guess that would be. <laughs> I've wanted to get in there, in there with them and in the mud for decades. Well... Gosh, you know, it's... I think they're angry. It'd be like being in a box with two rattlesnakes. Yeah, I think they're both very angry. Just, they're like, okay, rattlesnakes are good. They're waiting to bite you. They're just waiting for you to say something wrong so they can pounce on you to try to prove they're right. Now, today we have with us someone who... Well, she dealt with those rattlesnakes. For I don't know how she did a it. Decade, I, I a decade. A decade. I don't know how she did it for 10 years. So wow. we have Elizabeth Hasselback with us today. Mm-hmm. By the way, she is a real survivor, not only of That's The right. View, but of the game show that our friend Mark Burnett produces. That's correct. That's how America fell in love with her in the first place. That's was exactly. on the, I mean, survivor. can you believe that? From eating bugs <laughs> to then The View having to deal with the rats. rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess like you could say eating rats to dealing with the rats. She went from uh, Survivor to, uh, gosh, what was that other thing uh, that she did uh, after The View? A oh, Fox and Friends. Oh, Fox oh my and gosh, Friends. how can That's I forget right. that? That's right. She and was she, a big hit on that. She's an author. She wrote the book Point of View, A Fresh Look at Work, Faith, and Freedom. Which is uh, out now. Mm-hmm. And the best part about her is that she has great taste. She no no she married <laughs> her she going. married her, her college sweetheart. That's correct. And they have a great family. And she moved to Nashville. She did. She lives right here with her husband Tim and their children. So she has a lot of sense, and she makes a lot of sense. And I can't wait to share this interview with you right now. Why did you move to Nashville? I mean, I, I should say, why not, right? Right, I mean, why I moved not? I mean, it seems like the thing to do. You know, we were a little bit ahead of the curve, I think, on that. But I do, it was something that we didn't expect, particularly because I had a job that uh, seemed like a dream job at the time, and that was in New York City. And my husband has a job in Connecticut. And we came down for an awards show. And it wasn't something I had time for. It was a busy season for me. I was getting up at 2.30 in the morning to make it to Fox in time. And then um, it was on a Friday. We'd have to leave by Friday. If anyone knew me at that time, I was pretty much a, a zombie. And I didn't feel like I had much to offer. And I wasn't really sure, just based on my exhaustion level, that I had what it took to lead and be charismatic enough on stage. I'm not really a stage person. Um I'm more. I'm a people person for sure, but I don't think my natural gift is to get loud and welcome everybody and be a host of a big show. I just didn't think I could do it, um, and that was just prideful. And Tim and I prayed about it and said, you know what? Let's if we can take the kids, let's do it. I didn't want to be away from them. We left that three days, and pretty much everything went wrong on our way home. But we were so filled up. It was just what I can only describe as like the joy of the spirit over a weekend of just singing praise and being with some really great people and living it up in Nashville just with the fun things. But there was space for kindness here that we noticed. There was a a pace of life that we noticed. Um, And maybe it was that we were out of our element enough to take the time to really see it. Um, And we got on the plane and Tim is very practical. Okay. I am very not practical. And so I, I was, when we finally got our plane, everything had been delayed and canceled lost luggage, all of it. I said to him, Tim, I I think we're supposed to move to Nashville. Do you think this is where we're supposed to be raising our family? And he looked at me and said, I do. Mm. And I'm thinking, well, last time you said I do, it's a pretty big deal. You know, (laughs) like that's, this is a big thing right here. And I know for us is, and, and this is unique to just us, I think the way God designed our relationship is that he really gives like kind of nudges me with this idea and invitation to prayer, but he really will give the big decisions. He'll give that yes to Tim in a security way, in a in a way that he can kind of see what's best for our family in a way I might not. And so for both of us to be on the same page about it, it just seemed 
more than an invitation to move to Nashville. It seemed like a direction from God. And we really had a lot of questions about it. And we had a lot of questions from people that loved us dearly while we were moving um, out of what we had because that required pulling up anchors and some pretty big docks. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, and we just did, we really felt like God was asking us to trust him in this direction and get here. And we did, and he's been so generous with the, and this is why moments, you know, when you do something, you're like, I don't, we just obeyed and got here. And then God is so kind. He gives you the, and this is why. And it looks like this. And this is why. And it comes, it looks like a friend. And this is why. And it looks like a gentle invitation into a family that you didn't know before. Um, it looks like a chance to write a book that I never thought I'd write. It looks like all of those things. And God just been just generous is the word I keep seeing and giving us the reason after. You know, and we didn't ask for it before. We weren't, we were not asking reasons or justification for it. We were just going. Isn't it crazy when you look back and you can see how there was a plan? You can see how God connected all the dots, the various places that you went from A, B, C, D, that it wasn't just that you were just hop scotching all over the place. It was literally there was a plan. Mm-hmm. Tell me how the two of you met. So Tim and I met in college. Mm-hmm. Um, his brother, Matthew, was my orientation, one of the orientation leaders at Boston College and um, was also this faith-based retreat that I went on. He was a leader for that. And we didn't really think much of the other at first. He was, um, I think he may have called me a plain Jane at some point. And I just thought he was this hotshot quarterback who was about to come in a year younger than me and not really anything that interested me in terms of relationship. And we ended up working together and we did this ropes course. We were both orientation leaders um, at the time. We had applied and meant you stayed at, on campus for the summer. And um, we were, he was my belay partner. He literally was like holding me up on the ropes. And so there was trust definitely being formed as friends first, which I loved. Um, he seemed to make his way into the laundry station when I had to have to do laundry. He oddly had to do laundry too. You know, he was always around and um, we were great friends. We built a great friendship. And then I really think when I wasn't expecting a relationship that God just put him in my life. I need him. I really do. I really, um, and at times I can make him somewhat of an idol because I really do treasure him and I want to do well by him. And over the course of the years, I think I've learned that whenever um, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels or trying too hard or asking him for approval on things like that, I've made him an idol. Um, And I read something recently that was really impactful. It said, do do I love him like my brother in Christ? And so I've really tried to been focused on that. But we met in college and God just knew that I needed a Tim um, and that he would be just the very best like husband and father that I could ask for in our family. And so I'm really thankful for that. Um, he came to all my doubleheader softball games, which that's love. I mean, if you sit through a doubleheader for someone um, and it's a softball game, those are pretty long. And so <laughs> he would come and cheer me on. And I thought, wow, I'm, I'm a bench warmer here. So you're still there. Um, and it, you know what? He, I think our friendship has always been um, one that included a walk of faith and kind of allowing the other person to have their own walk. Um, and it's just great. It's great to see him like parent the kids and and grow to where he is. And college was just, it was awesome because we could, you know, we were sporty. We were usually icing injuries in the training room at school. And I think the big things were always the same for us. You know, the things that really mattered to us lined up. I think that's really helped us in our relationship along the way. Like we enjoy doing the simple things. Our favorite date is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And my hope is that if the fancy things come and go, that's fine and fun. But I just want to be able to have like a, an easy lunch always with him that's still special. And so we we do that. Like that's our that's my favorite date with him because we've always done it since college and we always will, I hope. Fast forward a little bit after college, okay, and uh, he went into uh, pros. Mm -hmm. How did that experience change your life? You know, it's interesting. I think once I graduated, I was working as a designer at Puma, and I knew that Tim and I were going to be together. I could kind of see life panning out, and I just thought, well, here I am with all these people that really love me unconditionally. You know, Tim's dad and mom, um, they took me in. I lived with them 
for a little bit um, just to save money after college. And Tim's dad encouraged me to apply for a job. And I had an internship my senior year working with a designer. He encouraged me to apply for a job in the footwear design industry. He was he really kind of opened doors for me that I didn't know I was capable of walking through um, professionally. Um, but he saw something in me, and I, I so appreciated that. And at the same time, they put a roof over my head for a year. So while Tim was finishing up his senior year in college and his fifth year season, I was living in his old bedroom in his house with his <laughs> parents and his younger brother. It was so fun. Um, and we just learned a lot about each other. Like we operate like a great family now, I think, mainly because – we were, we, we lived together. And that was such a beneficial like heart time for us. Um, and then Tim ended up starting his football career. And I remember saying to him, wherever you go, I know that that career has a physical limit to it. So I will go with you, which kind of was against the current of like, you know, take your own goals and run with them. I think when you're in a relationship, the message that can get twisted, I think to women sometimes is that God has you on a path. It may in fact include a man that has a heart for God and that is going to chase his dreams and wants you to be a part of them also and wants to encourage you in the things that you love as well. And so it doesn't have to mean without that. I think it's a matter of nurturing your heart and understanding that the opportunities that you're chasing as a woman or desire as a woman, part of God's plan for you may in fact be, and this isn't anyone, it may be a Tim in your life, you know, maybe. And so I really felt confident that God had placed Tim in my life and that he, being with him, traveling to be with him wherever he would play was just as important as traveling to pursue any job interview that I would have. And so I was willing always to just say, well, if this is where you are, I want to be there. I'll find something there. I'm really good at making good with what I have. And so, and it didn't mean that my passions weren't important to me. And it didn't mean that my career wasn't important to me. Um, it just meant that I wasn't going to discount the blessing that God had in front of me with this gentlemen like I just wasn't and it and that's key I think because I knew his relationship with God I knew who he turned to so that was comforting to me um and oddly enough the neat thing was Tim would say well if you have this great opportunity you know at the end of his career he had you know his feet hurt he was you know nearly eight years into the league as a quarterback taking sacks and running sprints and all and we had been, he had been brought to the Arizona Cardinals and I had traveled there 10 days before giving birth to Taylor and he was debating whether to keep trying to play. Should I keep trying to make a team? And he looked at me and he said, you have this opportunity that's secure and we have a family. And he said, I would rather be where our family's together and with something that you have that I think has legs beyond what my football career could offer. So it was a really, I think our relationship was just unselfish. We were both willing to go for the other. And um, I'm really thankful for that. That's always been something that we kind of like take seasons. Like, okay, this is what's happened. Gosh, you've been invited into this team or you've been invited to do this for a career. How do we make that work? That's good when a quarterback tells his wife, you have better legs than I have. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I can beat him in sprints. He just had knee surgery. I said, I think I'm faster than you finally. <laughs> Tell me how the whole Survivor thing happened. Yeah. Okay? I mean, did you get a call from Mark Burnett? I mean, how, how do you get on Survivor? It was a long process. The funny thing is I really felt what I would acknowledge now is like that nudge of the Holy Spirit, that feeling, that like confirmation in your heart and your soul that like you are supposed to be somewhere, but you can't figure out why. I remember walking into the, some of the interviews saying, I know I'm going. What are we wasting our time for? You know, like, I know I'm supposed to go there. You can try to tell me that there are 5 million other people out there who want to do this, but I know I'm going. I just knew that I was supposed to go. And I remember running about six miles or five miles or so to the first interview process and getting there and taking my, for some reason, I thought I should bring a pair of sandals and to switch into after I ran to the interview. And then they saw me putting my sneakers on back after. And they said, well, how, are you, how did you get here? I said, well, I ran. And they said, well, how are you getting home? I said, I'm going to run home. And it was just kind of what I did. And I think they probably identified a little bit of grit in me, which was really born out of watching my mom walk through her cancer. Um, I didn't 
unlock the door of fortitude and pushing through tough circumstances on my own. That was unlocked for me very early on in my life as a young woman, seeing someone walk through something difficult, knowing that's possible. And so when Survivor came around, it felt physically hard, but it felt finite and felt nothing compared to what my mom had already walked through. And then oddly enough, so I go to Survivor and I, you're allowed to bring, you get selected. Mark Burnett, you know, knocks on your door one night. He's like, you're going to wherever you're going. And he, I made this headdress during the interview process to kind of keep me sane because I was very creatively bored in a hotel room. So I was, you know, each scarf reminded me of my mom during her battle, my creativity, my family, my faith. And so I told them I'd take it with me if I went and I did. So here I am bringing this headdress as a survival item. And someone I was paired with named Roger Bingham, his survival item was his Bible. And I write about it in point of view. I'm so grateful that God placed that friend of mine to be right there with me where his survival item became mine. The word of God was our shelter. It was like a pillow on the ground in the Australian outback with nine of the 10 deadliest snakes. What I thought was my survival item was a reminder, but his was all of ours. It was literally warmth when it was cold. It was literally a roof over your head when it was in the rainy season and you're about to get flooded out. It it just provided such peace and assurance because there's nothing like the word of God and we had nothing else. So there was no distraction from the fact that that's what got me through. I went there trying to figure out what I was made of without all of my support systems. And what I realized was I'm not made of much without the word of God. And I had a great opportunity to figure that out in the midst of 39 days sleeping on the ground and trying to fish. I didn't even, I, I was not a fisher, man, woman. I was not a hunter. I didn't have any sort of outdoor skills. If I was outside at all prior to Survivor, I was running. I learned how to do a couple of things before I got there. But I, what I learned there was how much I needed to, whether I was in the Australian Outback or whether I was in Nashville, Tennessee, lean on the word of God and let it in. Um, it's a living, breathing word of God. And that ultimately um, is how I will survive pretty much anything. That was a real turning point for you spiritually then. Oh, without a doubt. Without, it's funny when you go to figure out what you're made of and you realize, oh no, this isn't about me at all. It's about God. It's about God using you in places. It's about God's provision in very limited trying circumstances. And even though that was a game, it was still physically hard. I mean, you know, there were things that we were pushed to do physically that I would have never done before. And so what that allowed in that circumstance was like complete physical surrender, which I'm pretty stubborn. You know, I've run marathons. I, even in Australia, I remember standing on a log for eight, over eight and a half hours, I think it was, just trying to wait everybody else out. I mean, I didn't give up easily. And I think the very thing that can be your strength can really sink you. I am a classic try hard by nature person. If I'm not qualified, I will train my way and work hard all, all through anything I'm in just to try to stay on the team. And that's a great thing, but it also creates kind of a bad habit of really focusing on your own will instead of his. And so that I've learned, he teaches me time and time again that you may try hard and you will stay there, but you will hit walls. And I hit them over and over again. And I throw myself into situations which I'm clearly not qualified for. I was not qualified for any job or situation that I had, I've ever had. I learned on the go. And the biggest lesson I learned in all of them is that I can work hard all I want, but I'm going to hit some walls. So here you are on Survivor. You last 39 days, mm -hmm. but I guess that that gave you the training wheels to really get to throw yourself into uh, survivor mode by going on The View. Mm. How, how many years were you on that? Ten years. Oh, my gosh. Do you actually watch that show these days? Do you ever watch it again? I haven't. You know, I, I probably would like to now just to check in on how the women there are doing. I've seen it up. It's kind of it's usually when I'm at the dentist. Yeah. It must be the time I drop the kids off from school, I'll write, and then I'll get in my dentist appointment. It'll be on. And I mean, it's funny. I'm getting a tooth drilled and I'm like watching them debate. And I'm thinking, what's worse? Like, this is better than in a, like that local anesthetic you get in your tooth. Like, I, this is so ironic that I used to do that. And for 10, 10 years is a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a decade learning under Barbara Walters, debating on some of the hottest topics, um, arguably on television every day. How did you survive that? just gotten the word. I remember Ann Voskamp talking about an audience of one. And it's hard because you're guaranteed when you talk about 
any of these heart issues publicly, you're guaranteed to make 100% of half the people very upset every single day. And that's hard. That's hard for me because I I write about suffering from FOLPD, which is fear of letting people down. And so every day I let some people down. But I came to a conclusion early enough that I wasn't going to walk through the days feeling great that I made everybody happy. I just had to go and feel as though at the end of the day, I was obedient to God. And some days I thought I could have done that better than others. I don't think I did it perfectly well all the time. I think when you, I call myself a recovering rightaholic. You know, I spent 10 years having to be very right for millions of people every single day of the week on the hardest topics um, to discuss. Now, what I did wasn't brain surgery. There were de- there are definitely uh, more intense, harder voc- vocations to walk into. But for me, it just trained me for 10 years to be very right. My muscle on being right about things all the time was strengthened. Um, so much so that being right became um, what I had to do. And so I write in the book that I spent 10 years making my point, I pray that the rest of my life I can just point to the maker. And I know that that brings so much more joy. I used to pray like, God, please let me be right about this topic. Please give me the the information that I need to get this debate right. I mean, I wasn't trained in debate. And now I just want to pray like, God, let me, let me be wrong enough, just wrong enough so that I hear the heart of someone else on the other side of an issue. Because I just think that's what he desires Um, That doesn't mean that I'm not going to take a stand for things that are really important to me, my family, what I believe, my faith. But I really believe that what you stand for has to come second to the God that we stand under. And if it's out of order, it gets really wrong really fast when you're trying to be so right. Just fess up. Do the hosts of that show uh, go out and have a pizza afterwards or do you talk to each other or do you like, you know, get in fist fights backstage? I mean, what happens? (laughs) You know, it's funny. You're kind of like this dysfunctional family in ways. You know, you do that for 10 years and you really have a ton of respect um, for the women that have been doing it because it's feisty. And, you know, my goal now would be, golly, like looking back on that. Sure, we hugged. We talked about kids. It's why Whoopi Goldberg and I are still friends. You know, we don't think the same. We just love the same. Mm -hmm. And we we really appreciate the other's heart. Um, But we would have, I mean, sure, there were dinners and and lunches and babies coming in. I mean, I had all my babies at The View. I'd bring them in the stroller and take them out. And um, it was like a family. And I I will say when I was, I guess would be considered fired, you know, mommy's fired. Um, I talk about it in point of view. That was hard. And so there were many years where I didn't want to go back and visit. I didn't really want to talk about it. And God kind of held my tongue. And what he did in the process of writing this book, he let me just feel differently about even the place that said, you're no longer wanted here. And he actually made me kind of excited to go visit them again um, because he taught me a great lesson on leaving well. And I think that there's something to that, like leaving well requires a ton of gratitude and then your heart will follow. And what comes is that peace. When your mind and your heart in sync and gratitude, you get peace. And so God gave me that. And what leaving well looks like, even from the view after 10 years, that dysfunctional family that I love still, is that you get to go back. You know, you get to go back. And I'm really excited to go back and be able to be with the women and share stories again and and just visit. Even though we might still not think the same way about everything, I'm okay. I'm probably more okay at this point in life to be a little wrong about things too. So you were fired from The View, right? Yes. Technically. When, when they, you know this from the, your TV world. Right. Like when your contract is not uh, right. renewed, yeah, you're that's fired. like fancy for fire. <laughs> like you're like, like right now, you're they're not, like, no, we're just giving you warning. What it does is you're you're fired in the future, which is almost worse. You're like, golly, like, so I'm here, but I'm fired in August. Like, how do we do that? And that was hard. You know, that's, I'm like, wait a second. First, the first thing that came to my mind was, what could I have done? Why didn't you tell me? You know, I pretty much had an asthma attack when they told me I was taken off guard. And I was sad. I was so sad, which is odd because it was like, I wanted to be there. And um, especially when you've worked hard at something. And then the second thought was, who would want to do this (laughs) every day? This is gritty. Um, And it can cost you relationships. And But when they tell you that, it's you're kind of left to figure out how do I spend the days in a place that doesn't want me, yet I'm still here. How can I do this well? How can I leave well and leave it almost better for the person who's coming next? And so 
that was an awesome discipline that God allowed me to have because it was a discipline. You know, I I knew that I would be paid on the days leading up to my very last contractual day, but they told me at any point you can leave, meaning you would forfeit the rest. So I was, you know, like I stood on that log in the Australian Outback. I will stand on my log here. But while here, I really enjoyed um, as much as I could just being thankful for the people around me, the producers. You know, I remember saying you to one, you were the best segment producer when it comes to products. You just like have a passion for this. Another one was so amazing at movie segments. Like I'm not a movie person, but she knew everything. So I felt so prepared going into interviews. Um, and just noticing the good around me helped me through that time. It really did. I remember coming home and telling my children and I just was trying to hold it together. And I was sad. I felt betrayed in ways at the time. And they were like, mommy, what's wrong? And I said, mommy is mommy just got fired. And my one guy was like, you're on fire. I'm like, no, I'm not on fire. Like I got fired. And what does that mean? They don't want me there anymore. Well, why? I'm like, I, I don't know. Well, did you do something bad? I'm like, I don't think so. And so you go through these questions and then you just can't have your worth be in that. Um, because it wasn't what I was doing wrong. It's just that I didn't know that God was going to use the rest of the time after that to do what he does best. And it's like, grow me closer to him. If it used, if God used that time of me being fired to invite me into a better relationship with him, I'll get fired every day. I really would. It's as hard as it was, man, looking back on it, now that I see through this lens that he's given me, I'm like, you use that to grow me closer to you. Let's do that again and again and again and again. <laughs> But you ended up at Fox and Friends. You didn't have the same uh, tug of war that you did with The View. Was it easier being there or was it uh, not as challenging? I mean, how did, how did you look at that? Fox and Friends was a real gift to me. Mm -hmm. um, I still debate, and I use the analogy when I wrote about it. I remember being back at my BC softball team and being a walk-on and bench warming for two years and just shagging any ball I could and finally getting the chance to pinch run in one of our championship games and being on second base and hearing the bat hit the ball and taking off and deciding that I was going to steal home. You know, finally the walk-on was going to like show everybody that I was worthy to be here, that I could do it, that I had the legs to get home. And I saw my base coach holding me up at third base and I blew right by her. And we had a rule on our team. If you blow by your base coach signal to hold up and not take that turn to run home, you better be safe. And I was so out. I mean, at that catcher, it was like she had an ax waiting for me. I was so out. I might even still be bruised from the glove that hit me. But I, the whole way there, I was. I remember running and being like, please, God, please, God, just let me get there. But I had already disobeyed. I had already run ahead of his will, like that base coach. We've got an awesome base coach in God. I still go back to that time between The View and Fox. And I remember chasing down the job at Fox, like knocking on the door saying, I have an opportunity to go and walk, work for you, Mr. Hales. And I think, if I'm being really honest, that I was trying to steal home. I think I was trying to get ahead of God's will for me to hold there in this situation of uncertainty. Don't go get it on your own. But I was like, mm -mm, no time for that. I'm stealing home. I'm going to show them at The View that I have worth in this industry. And that's what I was doing when I got there. And um, the good news about God is he knows us well. And he knows my grit and my walk-on mentality. And he met me right at Fox and & Friends. And he really used that time so well. And even though I might have blown by, even by a month, even by a week, maybe a year, you know, even though I went ahead of his hold um, and wait signal, um, he provided me with his presence when I got there. And it was an awesome team. He's like, well, this is a great team. It might not have been my timing. It's going to be hard for you. And, but I'm not going to let you feel alone. And so it was a great invitation to start the mornings at 2.30 a.m. in the word of God. I would say reading the good news before the hard news was the thing that got me through the years there. And I didn't get all the way through. And this time when I left, I was the one saying I needed to leave. Um, but Steve Ducey and Brian Kilmeade and our entire team there and Joel, our stage manager and all of our camera crew and T uh, Karen Dupiche and makeup, like they, there was a a real positive, hardworking feel at Fox and Friends. There was no complaining. 
and everyone was up early. There was no whining, and we had all watched horrific beheading videos. Um, there was never a fear of asking a question, and there was the permission to get things wrong and make it right. And so there were things there that I thought, wow, I got the opportunity to be in a work environment that was so positive. Um, but I remember my first week there, I would start to say something and then stop and look left and look right. And Brian killed me just probably looking at me like, why do you look like you're waiting across the street in case a car is coming? I'm like, well, that's how it usually felt. I'm not used to completing my sentences because I'm usually in this hot debate, four versus one. And so I had to learn, I had to relearn how to do that. What kind of began to sink me is that, again, you know, my hard work and really I think sometimes I work hard because I'm afraid I'm not good enough. You know, I just think, well, I can outwork my lack of talent. I can outwork ethic my lack of qualifications. I didn't go to broadcasting school. I worked with Barbara Walters for 10 years, but I don't know how to read news. I don't know that much about Syria and I have a lot to learn. And I did. I mean, I learned so much. And it was a gentle environment for me to learn, even though the standards were high in terms of information that you were delivering every day. Um, it was a real training field for the mind. And I just didn't give up enough on the day, and Tim would say this, to get enough rest to do the work that was in front of me. I wasn't sleeping. Um, I was I would stay up reading because I was afraid I wouldn't know something for the next day. I operated for the first two years out of fear that I would let my team down. And I really should have fully surrendered that over to God and been willing to make um, a mistake, get rest, and maybe ask him some different questions. Um, but they were understanding. It was really hard to leave. And truly, those hours for me and the season my kids were in, I didn't feel like myself at home. I felt just worn out. I went from being a participation mom, like, we're going to play catch and I want to play catch, to an observational mom, like, I'm going to watch you guys. Why don't you guys just play catch? I want to, but I'm so physically tired from sleeping three hours a night for two years. Um, but I, I'll just let you do it to a state of just lack of desire. I just lost my desire to do the very things that I love to do. And I felt like I was losing my soul. I talk about in the book, Toby Mac's song, um, I don't want to gain the whole world and lose my soul. I felt like I had this amazing job, um, numerous opportunities, but I was losing like my soul. So you left there. Do you miss having that voice now, that platform? You know, I, I feel like we all have a platform. I'm not sure that I was leaving enough room for the Holy Spirit to do God's work all the time. I think I was eliminating the resources that God would lay before us, and it's called rest for the most part and reliance on him. And when you do that kind of work and you are in front of a microphone on really hot button issues and you're not resting and relying on his word with that rest, there's a lot of room to say something that could be hurtful. And there's a lot, um, there's a lot of space that should have been left for the Holy Spirit. And there, my, my world was too tight. There was, it's, it was too immediate. And so I think for where I was in life, I don't miss having a platform that could potentially lead me to, um, be undisciplined and rest and say something that could be hurtful. Do I miss my friends? Absolutely. But do I feel like my platform in the morning with the kids or dinner with Tim or um, on a walk with friends is any less than it was? No. I feel like God, wherever you are, allows you a platform, and that's really just your feet on the ground where you are, to hear him, obey him, and share that peaceful love by his word with the people around you. So the platform, I don't really feel like I lost a voice, because I feel like I hear his more. Um, your book is Point of View, a fresh look at work, faith, and freedom. I noticed that throughout the book, you talk about your uh, treasures or trench ships, friends in the trenches. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Uh, in the book, I definitely talk about trench ships, and that's just, I love wordplay, and I think it's um, it's a word that made me think about the people that decide to just get 
in the situation with you or next to you in your situation. And I think we're all in those. You know, it's if you think about, um, if I think about my time at The View, if I think about um, my time when I've had health scares, if I think about um, the people that showed up for my mom when she was sick, um, the women that, you know, we walk with every day, um, there are people who are willing through their gifts to kind of get near you in your situations. And so we all have those valleys. And so if you think about those valleys as like a trench, um, those that are willing to be near you and show up for you in those, um, I think there's something really valuable in your trenchships. And it's just, and we're called to do that for one another. So when you you know someone's suffering or going through a time, um, dig into a trenchship, like be there with them. Even if there's nothing you feel like you can do to solve the issue, I think just being able to have someone that you can look at or be with or hear during that time it can breathe life into you um, is so important. I'm pretty sure God, I mean, Maria Goff says it better than anybody I've heard. Sometimes when you're um, asking God for an answer to prayer, he sends a friend. And so when I think of trendships, it's those friendships that um, are really founded in the trust that that person showed up for me during a tough time. So we're called to be that person. And we're called to really think about and appreciate, I think, the people who've done it for us. Tell me about a time in your life where somebody showed up, just dug in with you. Yeah. I and mean, was there for you. Sure. That's a good question. I feel like I have them, um, you know, when I was at really struggling just physically um, at Fox, I had a sweet friend, Jeannie, who really pointed me to the word during that time. Um and Jeannie Cunyon has been a gift to me because she's always pointing me back to his grace. Um, I think when my husband certainly has been, um, gosh, like top trendship there, he just is with me in all of it. And so that's a huge gift. Um, I think people who are willing to be there for me during times when even when it, Kathy Lee Gifford, she, that's a trendship. I, was probably in the biggest national, um, nationally televised like argument ever, um, walking around New York City, which is bustling and felt so alone. Yet she was the one person who said, let's meet for lunch, like in a public place. This whole city hates you, but like, let's get together and let's just have lunch. <laughs> and she breathed life into me and she gave me the peace uh, of God that comes from the word during a time where I really needed it. And so I think I really have been able to slow down enough to look back and see at all those junctures who those individuals were and I'm so thankful for that Sherry Shepard is one you know she would God put her right there in like a really tricky time at work to just pray with me before work and um, I wasn't really an out loud prayer at the time and she would girl let's pray she'd walk in with her little shoes and come up to me and we would, she would just pray out loud I was like overwhelmed by it at first but it just soothed me it soothed my soul so I think the people that are willing to be there with you um, and it might look different you know not everyone's called to like make a meal or um, write a letter or it might just be a little note it might just be a smile when you need it but you'll know you'll know because you're in that tough time you're in that trench time and there are people that um, just accelerate their hearts for you you write about your ice cream forgiveness party mm-hmm <laughs> It was with the kids, right? Yeah. There's a chapter called It's Party Time, and I threw a party for the kids, and it was a forgiveness party. And uh, it was a thank you because the night before, I had turned into a what I call a momster, and I just lost my temper. I mean, like, I love to be like, I'm this perfect, peaceful mom all the time. Like, I have days sometimes where I raise my voice, and I had had a really tough week leading up to it. We had lost a sweet friend, um, the second one in the course of a year, a young child that had... Um, suffered through cancer and our prayers were that they would find their healing here but the way it worked out is their healing came in heaven and so i it's that time in faith where you really are tested like do i believe what i say i believe and i did i found a real peace in that yet we're not meant to be separated from the people we care about and so i was grieving i think that's what it was and no excuse for my short temper with the kids somebody probably punch somebody or did something to someone else. And I just lost my mom cool and turned into a momster and raised my voice and have like six eyes looking back at me like, 
kind of creeped out by the fact that like mommy's not her patient self and all the things that I was telling them to to have in life, I was just lacking. I wasn't patient. I wasn't calm. I wasn't quite loving with my words. And I hated that about myself. And the next day, I had apologized to them and everything was fine, you know, with kids. They're like, mommy, sorry, I lost my temper and used big bad words. And I dropped them off at school and I can remember them getting out of the car door. And as like they got out, I describe it in the book as like shame and guilt and self-condemnation kind of like clicked them in this themselves in the seatbelt instead in their place. And all day long, I felt like I was riding around with these voices in my car like, well, way to go, mom. That's a great way to send your kids off to school. That's a great way to raise your voice and, you know, you scolding angry brow face with them. And that's a way to be a momster. Wow, you're just mom of the year, aren't you? It was just like all this shame about my parenting. And I try really hard at everything, even being a mom. And I knew that was a failure moment. Like, you know them as a mom. Like, you just have them sometimes because you're not perfect. And um, I shouldn't have raised my voice in school to them the way that I did. I knew that, but I could not shake it. Yet they forgave me. And so I just made myself continue to fall into the word of God and who he says I am, that He, his grace is sufficient. And as soon as I did that, it kind of like exited those voices from my day. Like shame went away and condemnation went away. But I really felt that these little kids who forgave me, I felt so loved by them that I wanted to throw them a party. <laughs> and so I did. I got Grater's ice cream, which is one of my favorite. And um, I talked about there's nothing greater or sweeter than the forgiveness and grace that God gives us. And therefore, we can give it away freely and that they gave that to me. And you guys forgave mommy. And they were kind of like, if you, if you at the time, Isaiah, I think was seven or eight. And he looked at me and he's like, forgive you for what? Like, they just forget. You know, kids are really good about forgiving and moving on. And I was still holding on to all the shame. And when I told him, I said, well, you forgave mommy for, you know, you getting into like kind of a little bit of a monster mode and like raising my voice with you. And I'm just thankful for your forgiveness. Thank you for letting mommy not be perfect and for forgiving me and loving me. And they were like, can we do this all the time? You know, because they have this ice cream party out in front of them. But I do think that there's something um, deserving of a party when you're forgiven. And I really felt like these little kids just forgave me and they should know the joy the gift that they gave me was so great um, because I wasn't ready to forgive myself, but they forgave me. And so it just was such a blast. We had the best time. And I mean, there's smiles on their faces, but it was just my way of articulating to them. Like, I'm not taking for granted that I'm forgiven. And I'm not taking for granted that you forgave me because it's a generous gift. It's a real generous gift. How do you navigate the, the water spiritually? I mean, I take it you read the Bible. Mm-hmm. I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm basically no, treasure not. hunting in there. Like, what do you say, well, that's God? Good. Help that's me. Good. <gasps> you that's, know? That's good. That's good. We live in a very unique time. I mean, I have struggles every day from a business standpoint. You know, I mean, we've grown this thing beyond your wildest imagination. And I was on the phone today with a, a consultant of mine who used to run uh, iHeart and Premier and whatever. And we were having a discussion. I said, in any other genre, we would have doors being blown wide open. We would have incredible advertiser. They'd be lined up around the block. But since we have the word Christian attached to what we do, mm -hmm. right, we have constant challenges, let's say. It's kind of bizarre because, and I, I love challenges as you do, but at the same time, I have to say, sometimes I'll go into a meeting and they'll look at me like, that may have been relevant in 1956. The world has been turned upside down. Now, we lived in somewhat of a protected bubble here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not in the left or the right coast. However, the money is controlled, for the most part, when it comes to media, on the left and the right coast. For somebody such as myself, who was on the left coast and the right coast mm -hmm. at one point, in a whole different world, and, and by the way, I'm a preacher's kid. It's not like this is all new to me, mm -hmm. right? It's been in my DNA since birth. It is not only challenging, but sometimes I just want to slap these people across the face and say, wake up because there's like 48 states in between the two of you. <laughs> and people don't think the way you do, but they control the money. So I'm only asking you this because you have navigated these waters. You have swam with the sharks, so to speak, and you've been able to get from one shore to the other. 
the church as a whole is going through a, a whole new place now. There's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of struggle on issues. There's a lot of struggle on relevancy. I'm not talking about the you know how relevant God is. I'm talking about uh, the church as we know it in America. How do you, when you wake up in the morning and when you live your day and when you surround yourself with these friends in the trenches, how you work with your kids, instruct your kids and guide them, do you ever wake up and go, oh man, this this Christian thing is just overwhelming? Or do you like just live in in God's word and in your in that world and you don't care about the other 90%. How do you deal with this tug of war? Or is there no tug of war in your life? No, listen, there's a battle every day. There's a battle. There's a battle for your heart, there's a battle for your mind. There's there's an enemy that's real. Um and so I for me, I know the protection and the peace even when the trials will come because God does not promise that trials will not will not come. You know, it says in his word, in this world, you will have trouble. Well, that's a bummer. But he didn't leave us here to deal with it without the protection and provision and the peace that his word offers. Um, I actually, on the days that I don't sink into his word first, I can get almost through the day, but all my like rough and like spiky parts come out. I don't deal with the trouble the same way. I don't, I feel more offended. I feel more... Um, persecuted. I feel more, and the same thing could happen, yet if I'm in his word first and turn to it, it almost takes an edge off of the attack. It doesn't mean it's not happening. I feel like the Holy Spirit has given me through the word, just if this is happening, God, what do you want me to see? If this is so hard, God, and it is, how can I get closer to you? And so it's not that the things aren't happening or that the attacks aren't there. Listen, I know very well that this, even writing about God, um, will bring critics. Um, I have to trust that my God knows 2019 and 2020 and 3019, and he know, knows what's coming. All he's asking you to do is arm yourself with his word. And so that whenever those big waves come and try to knock you down, like, He's, he's still your life preserver. Like you're not going to sink. He's not going to leave you alone. They will still be there. Um, and my prayer is always use this to get me closer to you. And so the word, like in Colossians, I've like, I never read through Colossians before. You know, I'm like, everyone's like, you're a really good Christian. I'm like, no, I need, I need to like get in there as much as possible. Like I'm still working my way through the scripture. I really am. I wish I were that person that could just quote it easily. I can do that. I can call upon scripture more now because I read it more now. Listen, it's not just for me. I might have a friend who needs the word of God because the world is saying something else. I might have a friend who needs truth because there's like a half truth that's being spoken over her. And so if you don't arm yourself with the word of God, what good are you to your friend? What good are you to your sister in Christ? Listen, because deceit is everywhere now and eyes are on phones, which have so much information and power to do great good. But like, if you don't get the truth, if you don't feed on the truth first, how well can you help your brother or sister? How well can you help your friend? So it's, yes, it's about your heart, but God's not asking us to do this just for ourselves. He's saying like, be a well-watered plant, a strong tree, so that when the person next to you starts to like tip, you can hold them up. It only happens when you have his word. Like that's just my experience, but there's nothing that compares to it. Like Colossians, I love, um, like I talk a lot <laughs> in this one study we did about Paul and how he was doing the stalling thing before. It was totally disobedient. And then God like turned him and then he was Paul. And even in his prison, even from prison behind bars, and we're all held back by something, like he was able to communicate the reason we're in the word. I love his so that, so that we can be unified in love. Okay, so that love is the unifying factor so that you're not deceived. Like the so that's that Paul says, I was like, whoa, I got to highlight all these so that's because it's like, this is the why. So that you are not deceived, that you can have the peace of God, which transcends your understanding. And so I think like, when I think about his message, it's like, I am telling you why you need to lock into the word so that no one can lead you down the wrong path, you know, so that you can be a well-watered plant for your friend. And I'm like, if this is God's instruction, 
I'm just kind of at a point of life where I'm like, I don't really want to disobey. You know, I I know you're there, God, but you're going to use a situation and you you will discipline me, you know, until I come back. And I've felt that before, but I, I just kind of feel like if the instruction's here and he loves us and he made us, like this is our manual. You know, like my Apple phone goes down or my AirPods go down or something's not working in my car. I reach for the manual or online searching for it immediately. Like, how do I fix this thing? It's malfunctioning. Like he gave us his this manual, this like living, breathing love letter of like how to work well for his glory and because he wants to be near to us. And like when I ignore that, I would never ignore it when something else was malfunctioning in my house. I just wouldn't. And so... I think given this manual that we have, and it's so much more because it is like living, breathing, word, caring, loving from our maker. Like it's there. Like we just have to get in there. Like I tab my Bible. It's like. So you have indexed, you put these little tabs on here. I was just going to ask you, how do you study? Do you do it by topic? Do you wake up in the morning and go, I'm feeling this. I got to discover how to deal with this, this way. Tell me something you've been dealing with. Um, I deal with fear a lot. Okay, so you're dealing with fear. Yeah. What do you do? I will look up anxious mind or um, scripture for anxiety and read in that book. You know, or I every day I will wake up and I read Jesus Calling. That really got me through my time at Fox and Friends and... Um, I also read a devotional by Charles Stanley um, every day in his presence, and that supplies me with a constant influx of scripture and I believe like word-centered devotion. So that's what I do because I need it, not because I'm awesome, because I'm not. And then I will try to put myself in a study that goes through one book of the Bible at a time. I'm not good at that. I jump around. So um, I didn't know that God was going to give me what he gave me in the book of Colossians this year. I was just thankful enough to be with a group of women and we dug into Colossians. And I'm like, whoa, this whole like new clothing thing. That's amazing. You know, that taking off the old and putting on the new. Oh, this is so cool. Like how loving is God that he gives us that chance. But so I am. And then when I find something, I mark it. So like we have a list in our house, even for the kids that has like when I'm tired, this is a scripture because in their Bibles, they have the Adventure Bible and the boys will like, one day they got into a little, you know, tiff. they get along for the most part, but they're human. Um, and one of them went to like a section on forgiveness in their Bible. And I'm like, gosh, I wish my Bible did what the kid's Bible did. So I did that. I just put these tabs in. What is next? When I'm in need, my mindset, when we're weak, when I'm tired, I must be tired. I must've been tired a lot when I tab this, when I'm afraid, um, God will never leave you. I mean, just the things that I need and I go to, that's, um, here's another one that I tab for what seems impossible. And I just mark things in my Bible and then take notes so that when that happens to me or someone else that I know that it's going through, I can get right into the word immediately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like here it is owner's manual right here. And again, it's not because I'm this like super Christian. I just, I'm thankful for an awesome God and he it's all in here, you know, and I'm I'm literally, literally like treasure hunting, but I've learned to like mark the treasures. The coolest thing is that, so I have this Bible that I have in my hand and have the one that Tim's mom and dad gave me and I can go back and see things that I've written in there and God is so good. You'll go back and you'll see your prayers or where you read something if you mark in your Bible and you'll see how he used that to grow you and grow your heart toward him. And you're reminded that his word is so good. It's just so good. It's, I could go back to it all the time. I'm like, God, I was praying about Tim's job here, but because he was let go on that team, we ended up here. And that's when this happened. Like his way is so much better. What he sees for us is so much better. Um, and then looking back in your Bible, you can see like, wow, you did that. You know, I tabbed this when this was going on. I'm through that now. And it made me a little bit stronger in my, in my walk further along in my walk, closer to you, God, closer to what you want for me. That was awesome. I'm so glad. So those are just like my, these are just things that I hold on to because I, I need them. It's not, there's not a day I don't. I mean. I think I've discovered your podcast. <laughs> what is that? No, no, I sit here talking to you. I think I, I, I think I've discovered the podcast. There's all these podcasts out there with quote unquote, the answers, mm -hmm. right? But Sometimes we do not make it practical 
You know, it's overwhelming. It's Read overwhelming. the Bible. No. Right? <laughs> Listen, I did not grow up doing it. It was overwhelming to me. I didn't know where to start. I thought I started the wrong place. And then I mm. kind of get like fear of missing out. Like I'm in James, but should I be in Mark? Like, should I be? It's It's not as easy for everybody to just start digging in. It's just not. I will say like the daily discipline of having something coming in because then it gives you something to come back to. Like I'll read a Jesus Calling and I always feel like every time I read, I'm like, how is this right for me? Like how how does this just so speak into what I'm going through? And then I look at the verse and it's just if you do that long enough, you'll, you start to like collect the truth. You know, like you're just collecting the truth along the way. And just like a recipe when someone's like, how do you make that, you know, recipe? You go back and get it. Like people, we need that, you know? So I think more for me, I feel like not only the blessing of it in my life, but the responsibility to like collect the truth because I don't want to be that friend that doesn't have it ready. And sometimes it's just praying like, God, I'll go treasure hunting for a friend. Oh my gosh, they're going through this. Well, what does God say about it? And I'll tell the kids they're going to be influx with like, a ton of information in the world. You know, there's information, there's sin information. Okay. Sin information is anything that's not from God. And that's not orthodox. It's not something that, but there's a lot of information. So in our family, we're going to look at it. We're going to say, what does God say about it? What does our family think about it? And then what are we going to do about it? And so that's kind of how we go about it in our house. Um, and if you don't start from there, because even we'll get it wrong, you know, like, what do we think about phones and usage and all that? Like, what would God say? What does God say about how we use our time and go from there? So it's, I'm just figuring it out with everybody else, but I definitely need like, I just need to mark the treasures as I find them. And I, they never fail. They just don't. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for your uh, time. This has been, I, I could talk to you for hours. Oh, I mean, <laughs> you're so kind. This is so, this is actually just a joy to be able to talk about this. God, you know, I think having come from the industry of entertainment to be able to use a gift, I didn't know I had, it was crafted along the way. Um, but to be able to use it to talk about God, I, I said to Tim on my way here, I'm like, I can't believe I just get to go talk about God and like how much I need him. You know, I really need him. And so it's it's been awesome to do that today. Thank you for taking the time to go through the book. Um, it's not when I thought I'd write. Next time we do this, I want him to come, the two of you. Okay, <laughs> we'll do that. How, how's that? Just give me the uh, uh, our friends here, the, the elevator pitch, so to speak, on your book, on what they're going to learn when they pick up Point of View, A Fresh Look at Work, Faith, and Freedom. You know, I think Point of View for me was just a look back at how when I tried to see things my own way, they weren't quite clear. And if I can get behind the lens, just when you're trying to do an interview, you try to get behind the lens or the POV of the person who's experiencing it. When I've used the lens of great teachers and ultimately the lens of God on how to see all that's happened and how we can see what's happening um, by his definition, um, it, looks, it looks a lot like love and it looks a lot clearer. And even when you cannot see the full picture, um, this is a faith journey. You know, there are a lot of leaps of faith that I took and they look adventurous and they look wild and I look unqualified in all of them, but I was glad to walk through this time and look back on how God was using all of that to get me here. Now, I really think that God used Survivor and The View um, and Fox and Friends all because he knew I would say yes at this point to talking about him. I believe with everything in my heart that he was training me along the way, knowing that I would say yes to this. And it's nothing I ever expected. I was a shoe designer who grew up in Rhode Island and studied painting. I This is not anything that I planned. And I do believe God created me and knew at this point this would be an invitation. And he just used everything along the way. Um, right and left turns to get me here. So I'm just excited to share point of view. Um, it's personal. It's intimate. It can be scary to share your personal journey. And it is. It's intimate. There are a lot of stories in here that even writing it, you know, made me quite teary on my back porch. But I'm not going to let fear stop me from talking about all that God's taught me and let me see in this time over the years. So that's what this book's about. It's just about how I see things a little bit differently now. Um, and even when I can't see clearly, he's he's teaching me to just really rest in faith. Um, and I'm excited to share that. I'm actually at a point of joy where the fear of sharing so much about my life um, 
might still be there, but I'm moving forward in faith that he's asking me to do this and I'll say yes. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you for joining Thank us. you. Thank you. This is fun to talk about because it's like, when you write, you're so quiet. I was like quiet on the porch for like a year writing and then I'm like, oh my, now I talk about this. This is even more scary, <laughs> but it's been a good, it's been a good heart project. Honestly, he's done, if nothing else, he's just done so much in my heart that I'm thankful for that. Thank you for having me and for taking a peek at it. Um, that means a lot. What a survivor that girl is. I'm telling you, she's she's really amazing. She went from eating rats on Survivor to working with rats on The View. <laughs> <laughs> and getting bitten by a few. Yeah, I think she probably got bit, but I think that uh, she always held her own. Whenever I did watch that show, which I do not anymore, I haven't for years, but I remember times I watched it when Elizabeth was on there and I was rooting for her. And I knew that when subjects came up, she was going to be the one they were going to go after. But my my gosh, that girl held her own. I gained so much respect watching how she always had a comeback. And it wasn't just to irritate anybody. It was the truth. She would come back with truth and with conviction. And I just, I, I really respect the heck out of that woman. Well, and we want to thank you, Elizabeth, for carrying the torch for all of us for all those years and uh, representing uh, so many people who actually listen to this uh, podcast. You've been our champion we really uh, want to thank you for that. And we also want to encourage all of you to pick up a copy of her book. Which is a Point of View, A Fresh Look at Work, Faith, and Freedom. That is now available on uh, Amazon.com and uh, at, uh, well, if you can find a bookstore, I guess uh, you can get it at a bookstore. Uh, do you ever go to the bookstore anymore? Not really. The last time I went to a bookstore, the place was like two-thirds toys and games and one-third books that's true but i've heard a bookstore is a great place to meet people really mm -hmm. so that's that. my problem so i went there one time a few years ago and i walked around looking for like a, a clancy book was so mike rowe really in there smart. did you run into <laughs> no. mike rowe no i didn't run into Mount mike rowe did i tell you that elizabeth <laughs> went through a bob goff event with my daughter colby no yeah they met and became friends in a it was here in nashville that he did a I don't know, in the last year. And they, so she came home and we were talking about it. And she said, yeah, there were some really cool people that I met. And um, one of them was Elizabeth. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Wow. Your family gets around. <laughs> we do, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> we do. Coming up in the next couple of weeks, we have the most amazing lineup. We go from Elizabeth Hasselbeck to uh, Kathy Lee Gifford in a couple of weeks. That's now, right. now, Kathy Lee, of course, is leaving. She is about uh, to leave the Today, the Today Show with Hoda. Uh, yeah, she, Hoda I think she's Kathy. done it for, what, 11 years or something. And she's been great then on it, too. You know, she is such a staple on daytime TV. Do you know that when I launched the Oprah Winfrey Show, Kathy Lee was our competition back in the day, back, really? back in those days? Yeah, well, with, with Regis. Oh, Kathy Lee and Regis. Yeah, they God, go that way seems back. Forever ago, and then also David, Jason Rabbi, or R R Jason Rabbi, <laughs> Rabbi Jason Sobel, who wrote The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi with Kathy Lee, is also going to be a guest coming up in the next couple of weeks. I did not know what to expect. Mm -hmm. We have this guy coming in, and, and and somebody turned me on to him and said, "Oh man, you've got to meet this guy. He is just amazing." And then he started telling me stories about this guy, and then he put he actually called him up and got him on the phone. Mm -hmm. And within 10 minutes, I was mesmerized. Listen, right? I thought I was going to have to bow when I met him. That was my idea of this guy. What a down-to-earth, incredible guy. So anything you you all have ever wondered about Scripture, about what you read in the Bible, but you just were afraid to ask, or you just take it for granted, or you just think, well, my, uh, my pastor says it happened this way, I am telling you right now, this guy will bring Scripture to life like you have never— yeah heard it before. Yeah, exactly. And he will teach you. He's a teacher. I heard him speak the day he did the interview here. I went and heard him speak. I was, as you said, that word mesmerized by how he made the Bible come alive. And to me, there is nothing like listening to a rabbi talk about Jesus and the word of God. It was pretty amazing. I know you've been to Israel before, but I'm going to go mm -hmm. to Israel and uh, I'm going to you have must. my first trip to Israel with Rabbi uh, and Rabbi. Kathy Lee. Yeah. yeah, they take groups a few times a year. And I could tell you those would be some great people to go with. You all are going to learn, for example, why did Re Regis, 
Why did Regis? That's a different guy. Why did Regis <laughs> ride Jesus. in? Jesus. Why did Jesus, not Regis, ride in <laughs> on the donkey? I asked the rabbi that question. I also asked him, by the way, do you know, and this is why you have to listen to this upcoming episode, mm -hmm. that Jesus really was not a carpenter. Really? Yeah. Uh, then where'd he get all his muscles? <laughs> well, you're, 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 you're going to find out on an upcoming, on a riveting upcoming episode of CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. And I'll tell you what, something else about this rabbi, talking about that Jesus coming down on the donkey. When people say to me, I don't think God could ever use me. I think I'm washed up. I look at them and say, hey. God used an ass in the Bible to bring Jesus down the hill. <laughs> he can use anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for listening to Contagious Influences of America, the podcast. Now, if you haven't done so, please go to the Apple podcast, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. We're also available on Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio app, and Spotify. Join us next week where you'll meet yet another Contagious Influencer here on CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. And remember, get out there and live life in living color because it sure is a lot more interesting than living it in black and white. See you next time.